Hello, this is Serene from Exam Hub. Today I'll be solving Physics Paper 2 AS Level Structured Questions 9702 Paper 2 variant to February March 2019. Question number one, part A, the ampere meter and second are SI base units, day two other SI base units. So one is Kelvin for temperature and the other one is um, kilograms for mass. Part B, the average drift speed of electrons moving through a metal conductor is given by the following equation, where A is the charge on an electron, F is a force acting on the electron, and um, mu is a constant. To determine the SI base units of mu. So constant mu is average drift speed multiplied by the charge on the electron divided by the force acting on the electron, where average drift speed is meters per second. Charge on an electron is ampere second and force on that electron is kilograms meters per second square. This becomes meters per second into ampere second into per kilogram per meter second square. And that gives me the SI base units for constant mu as ampere square per kilogram. Question number two, part A, define part one, displacement. So displacement is a vector quantity, which is distance in a specific direction. Part two, acceleration. So acceleration is rate of change of velocity. This is change in velocity divided by time taken for that change in velocity. Part B, a man wearing a wingsuit glides through the air with a constant velocity of 47 meters per second at an angle of 24 degrees to the horizontal. The path of the man is shown in figure 2.1. The total mass of the man and the wingsuit is 85 kilograms. The man takes a time of 2.8 minutes to glide from point A to point B. Part 1, with reference to the motion of the man, state and explain whether he's in equilibrium. So when an object moves with a constant speed or velocity, that means that there is no external force acting on it, and that's Newton's first law of motion, and that object is in equilibrium state. Here, this man is traveling with constant velocity of 47 meters per second, meaning that there is no resultant force acting on this man. Thus, he is in equilibrium. So I can write that. He's traveling with constant velocity which means there is um, no resultant force and when the, the resultant force is zero the object is in equilibrium So this time the man is in equilibrium. Part two show that the height uh, show that the difference in height h between points a and b is thirty two hundred meters. So this is what they're asking you to calculate this vertical distance between points a and point b. So from point a to point b here he is covering a distance of forty seven into two point eight into sixty. which basically is 7, 8, 9, 6 meters because he travels 47 meters um, every second. So according to the data over here, we are going to have 7, 8, 9, 6 meters being covered from point A to point B. This, thus, this vertical component will be the sine theta uh, to the horizontal multiplied by the resultant or the hypotenuse, which is 7, 8, 9, 6. So difference in height would be 7, 8, 9, 6 into sine 24 and that leaves me with 3200 meters part 3 for the movement of the man from a to b determine the decrease in gravitational potential energy so decrease in gravitational potential energy will be the man's mass multiplied by 9.81 into the height it is covering from a to b So the mass of the man and the wingsuit he's wearing is 85 kilograms. So 
85 into 9.8 one height from the previous part could be taken 3200 meters and that leaves me with 2.7 into 10 to the power of 6 joules of gravitational potential energy he had when he was at point A. Part 2 did the magnitude of the force on the man due to air resistance. So since that man is traveling with constant velocity, his forward force from point A to B is going to be equal to the air resistance, which you must know that it acts against the direction of the man's motion. His forward force can be calculated using his energy at point A, which is gravitational potential energy right over here. So the formula for energy is force into distance where force is his is the forward force acting on that man multiplied by the distance he's covering to travel from point a to b which is 7896 meters this is how i get a forward force of 341.945 newtons and as i had said in the beginning that his forward force will be equal to the air resistance so the air resistance also has a magnitude of 341.945 Nine five newtons, which is also equal to three forty two newtons. Since he's traveling with constant velocity, his forward force will be equal to his backward force, and his backward force would be air resistance. Part four: the pressure of the still air at A is sixty three kilopascals, and at B is ninety two kilopascals. Assume that the density of the air is constant between A and B. Determine the density of the air between A and B. So the formula for pressure is um, density into 9.81 into the height it covers the change in pressure was of 92 minus 63 kilopascals since it is in kilopascals so we must convert that to pascal and so i'm multiplying this by 10 to the power 3 it's equals to the density remains the same 9.81 and it covers a height of 3200 meters and that's how I get a value of 0.92 kilograms meter per cube of density. Part 3, two balls X and Y move along a horizontal frictionless surface that is illustrated in figure 3.1. Ball X has an initial velocity of 3 meters per second in a direction along line AB. Ball Y has a mass of 2.5 kilograms and an initial velocity of 9.6 meters per second in a direction at an angle of 60 degrees to line AB. The two balls collide at point B, the balls stick together and then travel along the horizontal surface in a direction at right angles to the line AB as shown in figure 3.2. Part A, by considering the components of moment in the direction from A to B, show that the ball X has a mass of 4 kilograms. So first of all, I'll divide ball Y's motion into its X component as well as its Y component. So this is its X component and this is its Y component. This side makes an angle of 90 degrees and um, this side also makes an angle of 90 degrees leaving this with 30 degrees of angle because this hole will make up 180 degrees. So momentum before collision in uh, X direction or Y direction will be equal to momentum after collision in X or Y direction. Before collision, X had momentum only in X direction, and that is mass into velocity. Mass of X is unknown to us and multiplied by the velocity which it travels with, and that's 3 meters per second, while ball Y had momentum in both X and Y, X and y direction. Um, on X exit, it had, it had a momentum of mass multiplied by velocity. It ma its mass is 2.5 into the horizontal component of its velocity will be 9.6 sine 30 and since it is towards the left it will be left with a negative sign so 2.5 into negative 9.6 sine 30 is its momentum before collision in x direction and its collision in y direction would be 2.5 into the y component of the velocity will be 9.6 cos 30 since it is traveling upward so it, it is with positive signs so 2.5 into 9.6 cos 30 is its initial momentum in the y direction so mass of x multiplied by the common velocity which both x and y share and that of y is 2.5 into the common velocity i'll consider the horizontal components of the momentum before and after collision so before collision um ball x had its momentum in x-axis 3mx 
and that of ball y was negative 2.5 into 9.6 sine 30. This momentum was of ball x and this was uh, the momentum of ball y in the x direction and momentum after collision both of x and y in the x direction is zero since now they both are traveling in the y direction so 3mx is equals to 2.5 into 9.6 and sine 30 and that's how you get mass of ball x as 4.0 kilograms Part B, calculate the common speed V of the two balls after the collision. So for this part of the question, we are going to consider momentum before and after collision in the y direction. So momentum before collision of x in the y direction was 0, and that of um, ball y was 9.6 cos 30 into 2.5. So 0 plus 2.5 into 9.6 cos 30 is equals to momentum after collision of both x and y in the y direction is their sum of masses which is 2.5 plus 4 multiplied by the common velocity and that's how you get a common velocity of magnitude 3.2 meters per second. Part C determine the difference between the initial kinetic energy of ball x and the initial kinetic energy of ball y. So, initial kinetic energy of ball x is half into its mass into its initial speed, which was 3 meters per second square, and that gives me an energy of 18 joules. And kinetic energy of ball y is half into its mass, which is 2.5 kilograms, into 9.6 meters per second square which leaves me with 115.2 joules and the difference between them is of 97.2 joules. Question number four, part A, define electric field strength. So electric field strength is um, either force divided by charge or voltage divided by distance between plates. So you can write in terms of force and charge. So electric field strength is force per unit positive charge. Part B, two very small metal spheres X and Y are connected by an insulating rod of length 72 millimeters. A side view of this arrangement is shown in figure 4.1. Sphere X has a charge of positive 3E and sphere, sphere Y has a charge of negative 3E where E is the elementary charge. The rod is held at midpoint Z, so Z is the midpoint of both the spheres at an angle theta to the horizontal the rod and spheres have negligible mass and are in a uniform electric field. The electric field strength is 5 into 10 to the power 4. The direction of this field is vertically upwards, so field is vertically upwards. Part when the electric field is produced by applying a potential difference of 4 kilovolts between two charged metal plates, um, calculate the separation between the plates. So electric field strength is equal to PD divided by the distance between the charged plates. Electric field strength is of 5 into 10 to the power of 4 magnitude and the PD applied was 4 into 1000 volts divided by the distance. And hence the separation between the charged plates is of 8 into 10 to the power negative 2 meters. Describe the arrangement of the two plates, include in your answer a statement of the sign of the charge on each plate you may draw on figure 5, 4.1. So, since the electric field strength is starting from here and ending right here, so this must have been a positively charged plate and this must have been a negatively charged plate. So, we can write that plates will be placed horizontally. with positively charged plate in the bottom and negatively charged plate on the top. 
part two determine the magnitude and uh, direction of the force on sphere y so the force on the charged object is electric field strength into the charge electric field strength is of 5 into 10 to the power of 4 magnitude into the charge on sphere y is of 3e where e is the elementary charge so 3 multiplied by elementary charge has a magnitude of 1.6 into 10 to the power of negative 19 and that's how i get a magnitude of electric force 2.4 into 10 to the power of negative 14 newtons and since we had placed um positively charged plate downwards and this is negatively charged so this will be attracted towards the positively charged plate and so the electric force will act vertically downwards Part 3. The electric forces acting on the two spheres form a couple. This couple acts on the rod with a torque of 6.2 into 10 to the power of negative 16 newton meters. Calculate the angle theta of the rod to the horizontal. So to produce a torque, we need a um, product of a force from two equal forces acting on both the spheres and perpendicular distance between those two forces. So equal forces acting on both spheres and their perpendicular distance. Suppose this is sphere x and this is sphere y distance between them is of 72 millimeters the force acting on sphere y would be downwards and on x would be upwards the electric force acting bo on both of them is of equal magnitude and that is what we calculated in the previous part 2.4 into 10 to the power of negative 14 newtons and will be the same over here while z will be over here midpoint of x and y and what we are asked to find is the angle angle from horizontal and for the torque we need this perpendicular distance from here until here between the two forces so torque is equal to one of the forces which is 2.4 into 10 to the power of negative 19 into the perpendicular distance between these two forces and the distance i get is 0 0.02583 meters now that i have this distance and i know that z is the midpoint i can form a new triangle where this distance is half of 2583 because this point is z this is the sphere x this is the theta i need and this total was 72 millimeters and until here until the midpoint it will be 72 millimeters first i need to convert that to meters so i will multiply that with 10 to the power of negative 3 and i'll divide by 2 to get the distance from here until here and i'll use cos theta so this will be 0 0.02583 divided by 2 and then divided by 72 into 10 to the power of negative 3 divided by 2 and that's how i'll get the theta as 69 degrees Question number 5, part A, by reference to two waves, state the principle of superposition. So, when two waves overlap, the resultant displacement is the sum of displacement of each wave so coherent waves will have constant phase difference part b2 coherent waves p and q meet at a point in phase and superpose wave p has an amplitude of 1.5 centimeters and intensity i the resultant intensity at the point where the waves meet is 3 3 i calculate the amplitude of wave q since we know that intensity is directly proportional to amplitude square so i'll start taking the ratios of amplitude of the resultant wave and that of wave p and their respective um, intensities so amplitude of p divided by amplitude of resultant i'll square them that will be equal to intensity of p divided by intensity of resultant 
uh, the amplitude of wave P is 1.5 divided by the amplitude of the resultant wave will be the um, sum of the individual amplitudes of both waves P and Q. So that of P is 1.5 and that of Q is unknown. We'll square them. The intensity of wave P is 1i divided by that of uh, resultant wave is 3i. So i, I gets cancelled and you get 1.5 divided by 1.5 plus amplitude of wave Q is equals to root of 1 by 3. That's how you get an amplitude of wave Q as 1.1 centimeters. Part C, the apparatus shown in figure 5.1 is used to produce an interference pattern on a screen. Light of wavelength 680 nanometers is incident on a double slit. The slit separation is A. The separation between adjacent fringes is X. Uh, fringes are viewed on a screen at a distance D from the double slit. Distance D is varied from um, 2 meters to 3.5 meters. The variation with D of X is shown in figure 5.2. Part 1 use figure 5.2 to determine the slit separation A. The formula for Young's double slit experiment is the lambda, which is wavelength, is equal to A X by D, where A is equal to lambda into D divided by X. The wavelength in the question has been given to us, which is 80 nanometers. Let's convert that to meters and now multiply it with 10 to the power negative 9. When D is equal to 2 meters, X will be 4 millimeters. So I'll convert that to meters. So multiply it with 10 to the power negative 3. And you get A as 3.4 into 10 to the power of negative 4 meters. Part 2. The laser is now replaced by another laser that emits light of a shorter wavelength. On figure 5.2, sketch a possible line to show the variation with D of X for the fringes that are not produced. So according to the formula, which is lambda is equal to AX by D, when you are now going to use a shorter wavelength, this also means that um, X by D also decreases. This X by D decreases, which is also... Uh, in the form of a gradient in figure 5.2 x by d y by x so we'll have a straight line but with a decreased gradient question number six part a using energy transformations describe the electromotive force of a battery and the potential difference across a resistor so in terms of energy we have to mention their definitions so electromotive force is energy transfer EMF is something related to battery EMF is something related to battery so energy transferred from chemical to electrical energy while PD is something which is used up by the component in the circuit so this is energy transferred from electrical to thermal energy part b a battery of emf 6 volt in negligible internal resistance is connected to a network of resistors and a voltmeter as shown in figure 6.1 resistor y has a resistance of 24 ohms and resistor z has a resistance of 32 ohms um, part one the resistance rx of the variable resistor x is adjusted until the voltmeter reads 4.8 volts so this voltmeter will read will have a reading of 4.8 volts while this one will then have 6 minus 4.8 volts which is 1.2 volts calculate the current in resistor z so current is equals to voltage divided by resistance voltage across resistor z is 4.8 volts divided by the resistance of resistor z which is 32 and that leaves me with 0.15 amperes of current the total power provided by the battery so power has a formula of current into voltage or emf since we are talking about battery, so we'll use the EMF, where current passing through the battery is 
0.15 into the EMF of the battery is 6 and the power we get is 0.9 watts. The number of conduction electrons that move through the battery in a time interval of 25 seconds. So um, for this, we need to first calculate the total charge being produced in the time interval of 25 seconds. So charge is equal to current into time. The current across the battery is 0.15 amperes into 25. So that gives me a charge of 3.75 coulombs. Means this much charge is flowing across the circuit in 25 seconds. Each electron will have a charge of 1.6 into 10 to the power of negative 19 coulombs. So 3.75 coulombs will have how many number of electrons? So when you cross multiply, you'll get 2.34 into 10 to the power of 19 electrons. The total resistance of X and Y connected in parallel. So since the parallel combination of X and Y is in series, is in series with resistor Z, we can use our formula V out is equals to V in multiplied by the combined resistance of X and Y divided by the combined resistance of X and Y plus the resistance of resistor Z. Uh, as we know that the, res uh, the V out or the PD across the combination of X and Y is 1.2. The V in is the EMF of the battery 6 into the combined resistance of X and Y is unknown divided by combined resistance of X and Y plus 32 ohms. And that's how you get a combined resistance of X and Y both 8 ohms. The resistance are X, so the combined resistance is of 8. The individual resistances will be multiplied, so Rx into that of Y is 24, and Rx plus 24, and you get a resistance of resistor X as 12 ohms. Part 2, the resistance Rx is now decreased. State and explain the change, if any, to the reading on the voltmeter. So the value of resistor X, the value of the resistance of resistor X would decrease, meaning that the combined resistance of both X and Y will also decrease and the PD across this parallel combination of X and Y will also fall. As a result, PD across this will now increase. And that means that the voltmeter reading will also increase. So I'll write that combined resistance of X and Y decreases and thus voltmeter reading increases because voltmeter is taking the voltage reading across resistor Z but not resistor X and Y. PD across X and Y will decrease and as a result PD across Z will increase. Question number 7 part A the names of four particles are listed below. State the names of the particles in the list that are not fundamental. So that's alpha, neutron, and proton. These are the three particles out of four which are not fundamental. Uh, they do not experience an electric force when situated in an electric field means they do not carry any kind of charge and that's neutron since it is neutral. Uh, has the largest ratio of charge to mass so alpha will have a uh, charge to mass of 2 by 4 which is half. Beta plus will be, it has a charge of plus 1 and it has a mass of 1 by 1876 and that gives me a ratio of 1876, that's huge. Neutron um, has a mass of 1 and charge of 0, so 0 by 1 is equal to 0. Proton has a charge of 1 and a mass of 1, so that gives me a ratio of 1. So the highest ratio of charge to mass goes to beta plus. Part B, a hadron has a charge of plus E, where E is the elementary charge. The hadron is composed of only two quarks. One of these quarks is an anti-down quark by considering charge state and explain the name of the other quark. So a hadron has a combined charge of plus E. One of the quarks is the anti-down quark, uh, which carries a charge of positive 1 by 3 E. And the other one is unknown. The unknown one has now a charge of positive 2 by 3 E. Now the only flavor 
which has a charge of positive 2 by 3 is the up quark. So I can write that that's an up quark, which has a charge of positive 2 by 3 E, where E is the elementary charge. So we are done with this paper. Thank you for watching.